This is Top Landing Gear. And welcome to Top Landing Gear and our final episode of the series, but one to put a spring in your step, especially if you're planning on jetting off on your summer holidays. But as we're all too well aware, the aviation sector has struggled to bounce back from the pandemic, resulting in thousands of delays and cancellations. From pandemic to pandemonium, it's a pantomime farce only not as entertaining. What will be entertaining, though, is our special guest, celebrity aviation expert Jeremy Spake, who will share his wit and wisdom with all of us as how best to approach our travel plans this summer. He's also got a wealth of wonderful stories that we can't wait to hear. And we've invited him to join in with our quiz. Well, we haven't yet, but (laughs) but we will. Uh, So stay with us to find out what happens. Uh, I mentioned pantomime. So let's meet the tragic comic characters that make up the top landing gear team. Firstly, he's our principal boy, usually the hero of the story, such as Aladdin, Jack or Dick. Um, everybody's crush with thigh high boots and a cracking pair of thighs from the indie pop sensation that is scouting for girls, the lead singer Roy Stride. Thank you. Uh, he's behind you. <laughs> no, he isn't. There you go. Very good, very good, Roy. Well done. Um, now then, I think we've done the front and back ends of the pantomime horse before, but only one of them is actually here, so we'll give him the benefit of the doubt and call him the front end. It's agricultural fencer and my little brother, Jez Curling. Hello, everyone. Hello, Jez. Well done, Jez. Now, like the fairy godmother, our pilot and resident aviation expert, James Cartner, is off flying somewhere, turning everyone's wishes into horror stories that they'd rather forget. <laughs> but he does, as you've probably heard from the laugh, he does join us via Zoom from where in the world are you today, James? Today, James is in uh, Kalkan in Turkey, and it's not work this time. For once, this is actually a break. Oh, how so I'm on holiday. Oh. I've, I've been on the receiving end of all the, uh, of all the pandemonium. Uh, today that's been fun oh interesting well, we might catch up on that in a minute and mm. ask what it's been like mm-hmm. oh, yeah. james on holiday making still making everyone's uh lives a misery though of course yeah. and um yeah, where I go? finally handsome and romantic prince charming is the hero in sleeping beauty and a song by adam and the ants <laughs> famed for their high camp performances i am at one proud and embarrassed to be jess's brother rob curling <laughs> I don't know what any of that Evening means. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Hello, everyone. It's uh, it's great to be back with everyone. It seems a long time since we last sat around this table, and uh, it's it's very much nicer with just three of us. <laughs> Isn't it better? A lot yeah. more room. A lot more room. Lot Less more of room. that laughter. I can yeah. pull that laughter yeah. down. Just, <laughs> I would just get rid of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. The beers. <laughs> guffawing. I think you'll find it's called guffawing in this show. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, that's yeah. right. Constant guffawing. I think. Yeah. <laughs> so we've all gathered, at Roy. I, I mean, thanks for making the time because you are flat out well, with touring. You moment, say that, but you've been doing a lot of commentary with tennis. As well. I've been doing some. Yeah. I did the French Open. Yeah. So I can only work abroad now. No one in this country seems to want me. But the job I did when I got back, very unusual commentating job, which I don't think anyone else has ever done, was commentating on the parliamentary tug of war. The House of Commons. <laughs> very against, topical. Yes, very topical. <laughs> against the House of Lords. Uh, it was a charity do yeah. in uh, Westminster College Gardens. It was absolutely fabulous evening. It was hilarious. Met loads of uh, celeb MPs, Angela Rayner for one, um, and a lot of people whose names I didn't know, but they were. But I see them. I see yeah. them a lot. And one, one of the future, one of them the future prime minister. minister. Yeah, yeah, one of them may be the future prime <laughs> yeah. minister soon. Who, who won? Knows? Who won? What? Oh, who? the tug of war. Yeah, there were several. Okay. Uh, actually, there were lots of competitions, and also lots of teams from around the country. There's one from Luton Airport, so people paid oh. to oh, okay. to bring a team. Right. 
And um, well, how did Luton Airport do? Surely, as Luton Airport, they'll all be listening. Like, yeah, they did really well. They won. They yeah. were brilliant. They yeah. had yeah. a men's <laughs> and a women's team. They were absolutely <laughs> superb. But Rob, Rob, now Sue Barker's gone. Surely, there's, a, there's an opening there for you, isn't that to slide in? There is an opening, but I don't think it's for me. I mean, look at me. Really? <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. No, you're right. <laughs> but, but thanks, thanks for the thought, Jimbo. <laughs> But Roy, you have been, haven't you? You've been all over the country. I've been busy. Yeah, we've been doing festivals up and down the country. It, like Scamp Girls is like a rat. Basically, <laughs> wherever you are, <laughs> if you <laughs> there is a Scamp for Girls playing a festival near you, within uh, six feet of you. Yeah, within about sort of three miles, wherever you are in this country. But yeah, no, it's been amazing. It's been amazing. And you did Glastonbury. Did Glastonbury? It looks amazing. It was incredible, actually. Glastonbury Festival it was probably yeah. the best Glastonbury we've ever done. Yeah. It was. It, it did. Was... Did the van break down on the way to Glastonbury? Really? Did that actually happen? <laughs> yes, it did, and that did create <laughs> really annoyingly. So basically, the van broke down on the way to Glastonbury. <clears throat> And it was by <laughs> Gloucester Farm Services. Right. So I did a video just because I was bored on TikTok because at the record I was always like, oh, you've got to do more TikTok. Yeah. So I did a video of 20 seconds saying, I'm here at the service station waiting for the van. Hopefully we'll make it to Glastonbury. And it got like it got a quarter of a million views straight no, away wow. because it was like very short, a little bit viral. But all the, every single message, well, 90% of the messages wasn't like, oh my God, or let's find you a van or a helicopter. It was always like, well, if you're going to break down anywhere, they're the best services in the country. <laughs> <laughs> would you, that was it. Would every... you agree with that? Well, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, there, were, there was the good thing about TikTok as well is you get the hatred, which I quite, I quite with social media, <laughs> so most, th well, most things these days, you just get all the responses usually just love because you're literally putting stuff out to people who like your, Ooh, not on Twitter. your content. Well, yeah, maybe not on Twitter. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's not just on your you, Rob. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, there, so there were a few comments which say, well, you know, do us all a favour and stay there, mate. Oh, really? Which I, which I quite enjoyed, <laughs> actually. Yeah. Uh, well done. Oh, no, yeah. my experience of social, not my own, uh, my own personal Twitter's, I mean, I'm quite mild on it, so I don't get too much hate. But uh, it's that people just, it's like people driving cars, who, you know, road rage. People yeah. hide behind the fact that they're sitting in a car and people hide behind social media to yeah. make their rather venomous points. Keyboard warriors. That's why James yeah. is in Kelkan. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. right, yeah. I'm hiding, but you should see what I'm hiding behind here. <laughs> Making your venomous points. But we, we did have, a, we had a nice little day out a couple of weeks ago to the airport. You and I. Yes. We did. It was really a, good. a podcast which will now make the next series. We yeah. went to Farnborough. Yeah. To talk to a bizjet pilot. Yeah. And that was fantastic. It, w that it was, was uh, great, actually. That was uh, yeah. a highlight. So that will be coming. Uh, that will come very soon. Uh, apologies for the slightly shortened length of uh, this series, but uh, Rob went off and did oh. tennis. Oh, <laughs> I, one job, I did some my gigs. one job this year. Yeah, <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> <away. Is> it? <laughs> so yeah. I'm look at James. Look at James. Waiting. He's my yeah. yeah. But we will be back with a vengeance in the autumn after the summer. So this is a perfect way of signing out, letting people know how. Uh, how exciting it's going to be to fly to their holidays yeah. this summer. I mean, yeah. James, we'll come to you in a minute, actually, and just ask you how, how your trip has been. But Jeremy Spake, our other Jez, will uh, fill us in on the situation as well. But uh, Jez, uh, anything to add other than fencing that you've been doing since we last met? It's really Gluing just... Gluing yourself been... to tractors, that sort of no, thing. No, I haven't glued myself to tractors. Uh, I've watched an incredible amount of <laughs> cricket that right. my kids have been playing yeah. various uh, locations around the country, southeast of the country yeah uh and uh we are geared up and ready and almost about to go on holiday ourselves ah. so we're looking forward to that great which does involve a flight yes hey. <laughs> this is yeah. quite pertinent this guy yeah exactly <laughs> and jimbo have you been busy or have you have you been yeah no out, the... outside of this holiday i've been crazy busy um a lot of american stuff a bit caribbean yeah all over and um no, just just it all seems to be again picking up. There's obviously issues everywhere, as were predicted, I think, by this podcast uh, oh. a few months ago, uh, and they are all coming to fruition. <laughs> so yeah, but um, keeping getting very busy now. Yeah. So where are you now, and how did you get there, and how was your flight and whole experience? So I am now in Calcan. Uh, so I used one of my um, staff travel options to take the family away. Um, and uh, other than the fact that the flight was incredibly early this morning, at something at seven ten, uh, we actually left. Which was, well, actually, we actually left early today, um, which meant getting up at three o'clock, which was quite fun with the kids, mm. uh, and then driving to Heathrow. Um, 
it's it's been a, a long day, but actually everything went particularly swim. Security was interesting. There's still not enough people in security, so that took a lot longer um, than expected. But other than that, everything because and I think because it's the first wave of flights, it went you know as I say early. Um, and the problem is that, that during the day things are backing up, yeah. and that's where the issue is going to be. And I noticed, I think it was yesterday, uh, Heathrow forced airlines to cancel sixty odd flights out of Heathrow because they just could, didn't have the manpower to safely deal with the, with the flights. Was that 60 which is, was that 60 flights on that day? On that day they cancelled 60 wow. flights out of Heathrow okay. which is what Heathrow said to the airlines you need to cancel as many flights between you. Right. Well, they've said, they said um, the same and, thing given they um they're limiting flying between now yeah. and September yeah. to 100,000 yeah. passengers a day yeah. to Heathrow. Yeah. yeah. Which is I mean it's about it's sort of 5% of the flights that are cancelled which Obviously, it doesn't seem much, but if you're one of those flights that's cancelled, it's the end of the world, you know. You've got so many plans in place, um, and if your flight gets cancelled, it is it is pretty shoddy. Well, um, and again, of, it seems to be... De- sorry, okay. mate, I'm flying out of Heathrow uh, Terminal 2 on Friday. It's the first time I've flown out of Heathrow yeah. in years, so we'll see. <laughs> to, to, to Gotham. Terminal Park. 2 seems to be okay. Does it? I think uh, it's Terminal 3 and 5 that have had the issues this week. So far, I mean, that's not to say it's not going to happen. Terminal two later. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's just people and uh, just not getting the uh, the backup. Still seems to be getting security clearances all through to get people working airside, and that just that's taking longer than it should do. They were saying on the radio this evening, what, just do not turn up more than three hours before your flight. Mm. There's just no point no. because all you'll do, you you won't get through any quicker, no. and all you'll actually do is just bung up. The works yeah. for everybody else yeah. who's trying to get on their flight. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if you turn up five hours early, you're just bunging up the works of people who have turned up, and they'll end up missing their flight because you're already gumming up the works. It's a yeah, nightmare, it's, isn't it? It is. It, it's it's one. You know, it's it's the sort of perfect storm of everything went to absolutely nothing for two years, and now all the barriers are down. Everyone can go everywhere, but there's just not the. the you know, we didn't anticipate quickly enough or. The world wasn't ready just for the amount of travel that, that needs to be done or people want to do because they haven't been able to do it for so long. Is it mostly short and medium haul stuff, James? Is that why your actual flying? Well, I think I think if because it's down to the amount of flights a day, the, 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 the handling of the flights a day, the, the, an airline would rather cancel a short haul flight than a, uh, a long haul flight because it's there are there are more short haul flights a day to, to many locations, so there's more chance of getting people on another flight. Um, and there's probably less money being lost if you cancel the short haul and if you cancel the long haul. So you're probably more likely to uh, to get away on long haul than you are on short haul. Yeah, I've just I've just realised it's just come to me what commitment James is showing to the podcast there because this is his first night on holiday, isn't yeah. it? The, yeah. He should be in the he should be in the pool bar or <laughs> yeah. at least a McDonald's somewhere. Yeah, well, you know? I, like, yeah. I, mean, I suspect he's done both already. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't found a McDonald's yet. I'm still looking for them. Okay. Are you up high, James? Looking down into the can? I am on the uh, yes, we are. I'm on a, the third floor of our uh, villa that we rented, oh. and we are up on the hill looking down. I could lift up the the um, the, the, the computer and show you, but I'll probably lose internet connection. Yeah, don't do that. But I'll try later. It's also a podcast. It's not really going to work. No. no. <laughs> For anyone. I could describe it. It's just dark. Man, but there's lots of lights near down where there. the Turtle Beach is. Is that near Calcan? It is. Yeah. yeah. Stunning is it? there, isn't it? Yeah. I'd be in there. I'll, I'll go yeah. find that tomorrow. Yeah. 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 Turkey. And were the kids, how were the kids looked after on the flight, mate? Were they, were they? Um, yeah, we, we, we were very lucky. We all got a business family. class um, somehow. So um, they all ate, drank and... Um, and enjoy themselves actually. It's all, oh, so you're it's very well a looked typical off. case, are you? Business class with this? No. With, was with this with BA or Turkish Airlines or who were you flying with? Uh, one of the airlines that operates out of Heathrow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and how was how was the landing? And how I know we've asked you this before, but do you sit there and judge? Yeah, how good a passenger no, uh, are you? That's what I want to know. I, I tried Better to Better than he is a pilot. <laughs> yeah. I, I did notice how much in, in, in a little Airbus how much closer to the ground you are than, than I normally am. That was evident. When I am a passenger, I do try to, to switch off from the flying role and, and, and let someone else do all the work, which is quite nice. I did notice that it's um, you know, how much smaller the, uh, the little airbuses are than, than the long haul aircraft. But um, no, it was, it was good to just relax and enjoy the service. Yeah, good service? 
Very good service. Bumpy landing. For breakfast. <laughs> landing was actually all right. It was very good landing. I was very impressed, which I didn't think the Airbus could land well, but it, someone did today. So, no, it was good. <laughs> nice. What nice. do you mean by that? I'm just, I'm just, there's a oh, big I Airbus see, Boeing because, thing. Yeah, I was on a, I was on a flight recently and um, there was an, an Airbus, one of the new Airbus, the, the, the 380s, I think, were there. And the Boeing crew, we were out together uh, in San Francisco. And I just noticed how all the Boeing crew were, were drinking pints of beer and all the Airbus crew were drinking Chardonnay. So we, we did sort of just have a little giggle about how, uh, how, how different we all are. But <laughs> that's what makes us wonderful. <laughs> so Airbus crews are just a little classier. Is and that you're just you're Luddites. I, I think it's probably class. It's a class thing, yeah. yeah. We're just rough and ready. <laughs> well, um, I was hoping we might have to, uh, all our usual features, the Ask James, which we've now sort of got into. And yeah. Jez with his quick facts. But Jez, how's your quick facts preparation going well, this week? Well, uh, unbelievably brief. Uh, to the point of non-existence. <laughs> not. Yay! Well, I thought I'd give you all a break. It's like, like an end-of-term treat. You know, it's like yeah. when you're at school, you let off lessons for the last day of term. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So there are there are no quick facts. I think the facts will come from hopefully from our guest. Yeah, no, uh, um, and they they may be may or may not be quick. Yeah, well, let's hope not too quick. Well, let's um, hope. He will, I hope, want to join in the quiz because we will, of course, as always. Have a quiz. There will be a quiz. Yeah. Some, things, yeah. some things never right. change. Hey. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Great. Well, now then, air travel right now can be a nightmare, unless, of course, you're James, who's had a lovely trip over to Turkey. But uh, there have been thousands of flights being cancelled, often at short notice, as the aviation industry struggles in the wake of COVID-19. Last month, the number of last-minute flight cancellations from the UK was up 188% compared to June 2019, before the pandemic struck. So what's the best thing to do if you're planning on flying off on a holiday this summer? Well, someone whose advice will be well worth listening to is our guest, Jeremy Spake, who you'll all know from the BBC's original airport series in the 90s and the airport Back in the Sky series, which has just aired on BBC One. And Jeremy is passionate about his subject and provides management solutions to transport businesses all over the world. But first and foremost, he's a self-confessed aviation nut, the perfect guest for top landing gear. Um, <laughs> Jeremy, it's so good of you to join us because I know you are in so much demand at the moment. But but you are an aviation nut, aren't you? It is your passion. Yeah, absolutely. 37 years down the road, and I still get an enormous buzz out of um, seeing happy, smiling folk getting on and off of aeroplanes. Um, it's an amazing thing, you know, when you look at how far we've come in a very short space of time, um, the evolution of, of certainly commercial aviation has been phenomenal. So every time I go out onto the ramp or I'm walking around an aeroplane, I can't help but just remind myself what a fantastic industry it is, despite the challenges that we've currently got. Yeah, well, absolutely. We'll move on to those shortly. But what was your sort of route into aviation as a career? Had you always loved aircraft as a boy? Yeah, so at the age of 11, I found myself standing in an airport watching, um, you know, the great old Soviet um, black smoking, gas guzzling kind of illusions and Antonovs. And, and I kind of fell in love with the whole idea of being able to send somebody from point A to point B and uh, get them there without too much stress. Um, so from the age of 11 on, it was always going to be a career in aviation. Um, and it's been a career that's taken me all around the world. Um, working both for airlines and airports. Um, and I now turn that expertise into hopefully um, uh, breadwinning capability and satisfying a few very disgruntled airport executives and an airline <laughs> chief. <laughs> yeah, so can, I, can I just say, yeah. sorry, I don't know, just interjecting. I generally have a real fear of um, aviation TV programs because <laughs> they're normally so appallingly done uh, with yeah. people who have no idea what they're talking about. Having recently watched your Back to the Sky, I can only say, without blowing too much smoke up your, the other way, how <laughs> impressed I was with, A, your aviation knowledge. Um, because you you talk about it as somebody who really does know the industry. And for some, myself who knows the industry, you know, you, the amount of times you see these idiots go and <laughs> put themselves yeah. forward. And I can only just really congratulate you on... on Doing what you do so very well, to be fair, you, you come across as an incredibly likable person, but also the knowledge and depth of knowledge and the experience just shows through. So, and so, thank you on behalf of the aviation industry for being somebody up there who knows what they're talking about. 
I really appreciate that. In actual fact, the, the, the whole business of going back on and doing um, the airport back in the skies um, was driven out of a real desire and a passion to um, educate the public just what we had been going through um, because everybody understood how devastating things have been for the NHS. Um, and when you actually started to show people the sheer extent and the impact that the, the coronavirus had had on aviation and the impact and the detrimental effect it had on so many professional people, um, you know, I was really nervous that we weren't going to do justice to it because it's something I'm desperately passionate about. We, we are an amazing industry with an amazing group of folk who are in it, not for the money because there isn't a great deal of money in aviation. They're in it because they genuinely love looking after people and, and being around um, amazing aeroplanes. So to be able to show that to the public and to educate them along the way about how it works and why it doesn't work some days um, better than others um, was, to be honest, a real honour. And I've been blown away, to be uh, frank, about the, 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 the level of response from industry, um, all the way from, you know, airline CEOs and, and uh, big uh, airport conglomerates right through to the average person in the street saying thank you so much because actually we had no idea it was that bad um, mm. and um, you know and even now the, the conversations are all about so how long is this going to take when are we going to see the, the the end of this misery well the only way I see it changing is when we start getting back to being a bit more realistic with what we charge people to sit inside aeroplanes um, yeah. because Actually, we've had so many people leave the industry because there's no job security. Um, you know, one one uh, pilots in particular, you know, we're, we're about to have a massive um, shortage of them around the world. Um, and some airlines are playing silly beggars with their co contracts with pilots. And, um, you, you know, we're not going to talk about Scandinavia too much, but um, they're rightly fed up at the moment. Um, so we have some challenges, but, you know, they are going to be less travellers. And um, uh, they're going to have to pay more to, to be there. I mean, the cost of fuel alone, there's only so much hedging you can do before it starts yeah. to have an impact. So all of that cost has to go somewhere. So, um, But for all of that, it's still a, a truly amazing industry with the most amazing people in it. It's, it's a family thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I could literally bump into anybody anywhere in the world that's an aviation person and we could sit and talk forever because yeah. it's that sort of industry. Uh, Jeremy, you, if, love if, there. you love it, the three of you. Look, the, the yeah, three do. of you that are, 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 are pilots flying triple seven. You're sitting there, but that's the thing about aviation because uh, you know I defy anybody to look at an aeroplane taking off and not think, even just the, the person with the least amount of interest in it. How does that happen? <laughs> what, what, I still, what, I still, what, still there. Especially <laughs> flying. Yeah. Yeah, Jeremy, I'm really interested in saying there's going to be less <laughs> flying or fewer flights. Where is that going to impact more? Because I've got some friends who are in business and they say that, you know, sort of senior levels, their their businesses are now saying, we're just not going to send you across the water to the States or long hauls of Australia for a for a, a junket or a, you know, a meeting. But is, sure. so, so industry is going to cut down because it's expensive and they've got their, their net zero targets. But is the biggest reduction in flying, do you think, going to be the sort of holiday short haul end? Is that where it's going to be most impacted? So um, definitely what we're going to see over the next two to three months, because, um, you know, it isn't just the simple business of the airport and the airlines not having enough staff. It's also the really key piece, air traffic control. So a lot of um, the, the last minute cancellations that have been happening in Europe recently have been because the air traffic centres across Europe haven't had the level of staffing and manning that they require to take what we were used to in the 2019 volumes of traffic. So airlines that offer long haul flying and a short haul program, um, they would be committing um, almost, you know, business suicide if they didn't do everything they could to keep their long haul flying program going. Because those, particularly the airlines that are operating wide bodied aircraft, because you might not necessarily have a lot of passengers sitting in them, but you're certainly going to have freight in them. And, that is a, a, a surefire way of keeping the revenue streams open. So I think what we're going to see is where, um, and, you know, the national carrier in the UK did this this week sensibly. It looked at destinations where it's offering six, seven, eight, eight rotations a day. And it's saying this is overkill. Um, there's potentially too much capacity. And we certainly don't have the manning to, to, to be able to staff up for this. 
So if it's a short haul flight, domestic flying is also going to be heavily impacted. So my advice to people who live out in the regions, if they can avoid the bigger hubs, the Heathrows, the Manchesters and the Gatwicks until this sort of time next year, and they can do a regional departure instead, they stand a, a better chance of not being impacted by um, cancellations. Um, and some of that's borne out of the fact that um, you know, the regional flying, because it's generally thinner anyway, um, it'll be one one or two rotations a day. Um, but then on the on the transatlantic crossings, they'll absolutely be operating. I mean, I was talking to uh, the CEO of Aer Lingus last week and um, they're just full and they're struggling like, like mad to, um, you know, to keep ahead of the booking um, profile. So, um, yeah, European stuff is going to be challenging for a lot of people. And even Lufthansa said earlier this week that... Um, they are going to um, definitely struggle until October to maintain a full flying program. Gosh. So you think low low cost fares, Jeremy, will soon be a thing of the past, and it will all get a little bit more realistic in terms of what people are, are paying to fly. Yeah, I really do, Rob. I think that what what's been going on for years and years and years, um, when when there was no challenges and the fuel prices were reasonable, um, the, the low cost airlines have been able to go in. Um, there's an Irish one in particular that has done an incredible job of negotiating its aircraft deals um, with Boeing. Um, so all of those things enabled them through sheer volume of numbers to offer X number of seats on each aircraft at silly prices, you know, nine ninety nine to wherever. Um, those days are gone, certainly in the in the medium term um, and the short and medium term future, simply because the rising cost of fuel, um, airlines will generally hedge so they buy in advance um, no more than about 50 percent of their fuel um, because it's a real lottery. I mean, you imagine if you knew that you were going to be paying at the petrol pumps today, 199 a litre. But you could have bought it six months ago at a pound. You'd have been finding all manner of places to store it <laughs> yeah. um, or at least have a deal with someone that meant you could go and draw down on it. So fuel companies like like airlines and governments and airports, they like them to buy their, their fuel in advance. But they never like them to commit an entire um, block of cash because they could be exposing themselves to extra risk because the price could come down. But it hasn't. It's still sitting around that that fairly high level um, in the US dollar per barrel. So what's going to happen is that is going to find its way onto airfares because it's the only place it can go. So what we'll see is the 999 days will be history for quite some time. And even, you know, Ryanair's um, commercial officer went on record last week saying exactly this, um, you know, he, he mirrored and echoed the stuff that I've been saying a month before that um, it's unsustainable um, because there's less disposable income so when people are spending money, um, they're going to spend it wisely. Um, but airlines will have less customers and they're going to have to charge more to keep their planes full. Interesting you mentioned Ryanair because it seems that Ryanair is, is one of the few airlines that appears to be totally unaffected by all the problems that the other airlines are having. And in fact, I, I read an interview with um, Mr. O'Leary <laughs> in, in the paper a couple of weeks ago. And I mean, he's very good at publicizing his airline, but it, it does seem like that during the furloughing process, they got it right by not getting rid of any of their staff. So they are fully up to strength from, from the word go to get, keep everything running smoothly. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, they have a I mean, the, the Ryanair group is a, is a number of airlines. It includes Lauda, it includes Buzz. Um, it includes a, a Maltese um, subsidiary. So um, their contractual arrangements are very different to most airlines. So he all, already had, long before any kind of pandemic, he already had a very robust way of managing his, his flight deck crew. And his cabin crew, are uh, uh, by and large, 95% of them are not employees of the airline. They're actually employed through agencies. Um, it's generally only the number ones on their aircraft that are actually employed by them. So he's always had a, a very flexible approach to his staffing. Some would argue that it's... Um, uh, you know, it's not the, the best way of keeping people incentivized to fly. But, you know, he'll, he'll always get pilots because um, he's always got aeroplanes that need them. So, you know, I, I think that the challenge was always for um, particularly network carriers because they you tend to find that the larger network airlines, they, they are offering multiple aircraft types 
multiple destinations. It brings a level of complexity that a low cost carrier doesn't have because a low cost carrier will keep one type of aircraft. That's one type of crew training. It means that, you know, and even if you look at his his other companies that are in the Ryanair group, with the exception of Lauda, they're all operating 737s. So he can interchange crews and, and, you know, never have an issue. Whereas if you're running a large network airline that's got wide-bodied aeroplanes, you know, the, the ability to switch pilots from one type to another is, is slightly more difficult because, um, you know, cockpit commonality is, isn't, isn't as obvious in, in wide-bodied aircraft. I mean, Boeing in the old days with the 757 and the 767 specifically designed the flight deck so that those um, crews that could operate one would be able to operate the other. And it was a godsend to British Airways because those two aeroplanes were the backbone of an awful lot of its flying programme. Um, and that's been superseded by uh, a mix of aeroplanes in its wide body fleet. Um, and so it brings added complexity. And so, you know, when you knew you were going to be operating wide bodied aeroplanes, you weren't going to be operating necessarily, um, you know, bundles of A350s. You were going to do triple sevens. You weren't going to operate 747s. So all of those 747 pilots, they needed to go somewhere. But um, there wasn't sufficient flying or aeroplanes to give them work or to train them. So a lot of them ended up having to disappear into the into the ether. And many of them ended up working on um, Project Wingman, which was with the NHS. And I really take my hat off of them. But if, you, if you're if you a professional and you look on LinkedIn, every day there's another pilot going on and saying, I've got a job again, I'm back in the air. <laughs> and you'll discover that they've gone from being a really senior captain, four stripes, sitting in the left-hand seat in an airplane. Now they're suddenly back to having three stripes potentially sitting in a, a completely different type of aircraft doing completely different types of flying. The most impressive airline, I think, from a European point of view, um, has actually been Air Baltic um, because they've got one aircraft type and the A220 is a really brilliant little bit of a kit. It's a fantastic aeroplane and it's got very long legs. It can do lots of different things. James doesn't agree, but it, 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 it. <laughs> I'm only showing my anti Airbus uh, streak coming through. No, that's cool. You're allowed, James. But the, the great news is, of course, that the Airbus 220 was originally a Canadian project. Yeah. Um, the CS. Um, um, it was a bombardier, wasn't it? Uh, uh, it was, yeah. Um, yeah. And it's a really, really good little aeroplane. And mm. um, they're able to do lots of things with it. And the, the economics of running it are phenomenal because you only need a, a 30% load factor um, because of the engine technologies and that. It, it, it's kind of. It's a no-brainer for them. But yeah. if you're in a in a world where you're operating 787s that are fairly heavy anyway, um, and you've got this really interesting business model that allows people to travel for a fiver, it, you've got to pack them in. Um, <laughs> and that, that's not easy. That's really yeah. interesting. So in terms yeah. of fleet sizes going forward and the makeup of fleets, do you think we're – are we going back to narrow-bodied for almost everything, do you think? I think one of the things that's really interesting to watch, um, and, and James will have, definitely have an opinion on this because it's Airbus, but um, if you look at the, the, the A321neo um, and you look at the, the long range and now the XLR, so the extended long range aeroplane, what they've done is they very cleverly have taken the business that was the Boeing 757 and they've replicated it in the A321. Now, the 757, I don't care what anybody says, um, was probably the best aeroplane that Boeing ever made because it was originally designed for 30-minute, 40-minute sectors, climb high, stay high, burn less fuel, um, you know, shuttle route for Eastern Airways and British Airways in the day. And that aeroplane absolutely nailed it. But then suddenly they discovered it could go really long distances, carrying decent payloads um, and be really efficient. And what Airbus have done, surprisingly, uh, you know, with the leap technology of engines, they've now got an aeroplane that can fly across the Atlantic, burn about 17 tonnes of fuel to New York from, from Manchester, um, you know, with 140 people on it, all smiling and happy and delighted, delighted at the experience. I mean, in the case of Aer Lingus, I think it's about 180 passengers. Um, and that is, for the moment, the way ahead. Um, there will always be routes where wide-bodied aeroplanes will always need to operate. Um, and bizarrely, places like Lagos and Abuja, um, you know, they're routes that will always require a big aeroplane mm -hmm. because they're yeah. always full and they're great routes because they pay by cash and it is 
uh, just the nature of those type of routes. And some routes require wide-bodied aeroplanes because of cargo. So anything going to China, Japan, Korea, any of those routes, that's all good business. But some of these thinner routes, uh, particularly across the Atlantic, um, they don't require large aircraft unless you've got cargo volumes to sit in mm -hmm. the belly um, because the, the, the passenger revenues are just not sufficient to make it work. However, 321 with the leak engines on them, that's a game changer for a lot of airlines, uh, particularly people like Aer Lingus, um, where, it, you know, they're operating a hybrid model between low cost and a, and a kind of a traditional legacy type product. Um, so every every time they're saving themselves 30 percent on the fuel burn, that's just good news for everyone. And it's great for the environment. Yeah. And I think what's really nice is that we'll we'll see further development, I suspect, with the 787. Um, they're obviously working on a on a, a new 777. I mean, the 777 is a brilliant aeroplane. It really is. I mean, the cargo capacity in the belly of one of those things is phenomenal. Mm. You know, what? You, it, it kind of put the 747 out of business, to be brutally yeah. honest. With you. <laughs> Seven. Truly, yeah. uh, you, could, you could do exactly what you were doing with a 747 with a twin-engined aeroplane. So, yeah. Yeah, it's um, but narrow body flying longer distances is going to be the mode of the next five to ten years, definitely. What's the experience like for passengers though doing long haul in narrow body? I think in your series, recent series, didn't you go with was it Jet Blue you, you flew with? I did. You know, I'm I'm a real I'm old fashioned. See, I like to walk onto an aeroplane two aisles. I like to be greeted by, you know, people who've done years and years of flying and all that. You feel safe and, you know, sit there with choices of wine and all those sort of things. <laughs> and I was therefore very, very sceptical about a long haul journey um, <laughs> in a narrow body aeroplane with an airline who are, you know, they're good at what they do. I've flown with them in the States. I've done transcontinental with them um, uh, in the past. I've been quite impressed with them. I wasn't sure they were going to be able to nail it across the Atlantic because, they were they were really stepping into fairly big shoes because some of the carriers going across the Atlantic with a premium product offer really good premium products. But I tell yeah. you what, for the moment, those guys have absolutely nailed it. The crew were phenomenal, um, and uh, the, you know everybody was getting really good service. I didn't feel hemmed in, didn't feel cramped. Um, I sat the guys down down the back. Um, and watched them all ordering their choice of menu and, uh, you know, talked about the, the seat pitch. You know, they've all got 36 or 38 inches of seat pitch in the back. Um, the aircraft was incredibly quiet. Um, the, the disadvantage is that it's obviously flying lower down. Um, so, it, you know, the air is not necessarily as smooth as it might have been. But I, I have to say... Um, when you look at what they're charging, the only thing you don't get if you're a business class passenger is access to a lounge and a limo to get you to the airport. But not every airline offers a limo to the airport. Mm -hmm. It's only, it's only, you know, um, Dickie who offers that. Um, <laughs> the, uh, um, so, uh, but the truth is, if you're not bothered about sitting in in the, the Concorde lounge or whatever it is in Terminal Five nowadays with the horses with the lamps coming out the top of their heads, um, <laughs> then actually Jet Blue is a really good alternative. And I have to say, what I like about it, and I think this is really important, even if you're not somebody that would choose to fly with Jet Blue, their arrival on the on the route it disturbs the market and it makes everybody start to up their game a bit. And I really like that because if everybody starts to make more of an effort with their customers, um, it just is good news for everyone. There's enough people for these airlines to not be predatory with one another. Because that's one of the things I really hope is going to happen over the next um, 18 months or so. We're all in this together. We have to all be in this together because um, the industry mm. is in a real dire situation. And if we're going to start seeing yep. predatory competitive behaviours, um, you know, almost like when you see people were buying houses, you know, back in the day when everybody was gazumping 15 minutes after you've put in an offer thinking I've got it and then you haven't. Airlines have got to not do that and airports have got to not do that because we, we've got to work together and we've got to have a, a single voice um, at governments around the world to say, look, the world can't survive without aviation. It's become a, an absolute integral part of national and global economies. Um, so it is that important. Now we need to start looking after the people that work in it so that we can keep people safe. You know, some of the amazing work being done to redesign airspace um, and to, you know, get away from these 
predetermined flight paths that we've yeah. been using for decades when we never need to now. Mm. You know, satellite technology is absolutely incredible. I mean, if you think about the average person that's watching the podcast, they've probably got flight radar or something similar. Um, they've got as much information in their hand <laughs> as an air traffic controller has sitting in front of a screen. Um, you know, yeah. it, it's there. Yeah. And in fact, sometimes <laughs> they'll get a... They'll get a squawk for a for a, a you know a diversion or something, and they'll be tweeting that it's happening, and the air traffic controller is only just popping on. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the reality of it is that um, we're an industry that has to work really, really hard to keep people safe, um, and that comes at a price. Um, and we need everybody to work together to make that happen because you can't compromise on that. That's why um, you'll have probably seen the, the Wiz um, CEO. I mean, if ever there was a man who needed to be taken out and summarily dealt with, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was unbelievable. That was wasn't it, James? I mean, you know yourself. If you if you call in crewing, you phone the crewing mm. team and you say, I'm, I've got fatigue. I mean, the minute you say yeah. fatigue, you hit this big alarm in the crewing room and the lights start mm. flashing and mm. the doctors are, are mm. put on the phone and the person's, you know, lay down yeah. in the dark room. We're going to talk about this for a week. <laughs> Chill. But this guy, is, he's, mm. he's almost threatening them and it's like, behave. Uh -huh. It's just unacceptable. And I must so, say, so that the one thing that really got me about that was the, I, I've worked for, oh. I've worked for big, um, Ever call fatigue if they weren't actually fatigued? You know, that, that, that's a, the the real gotcha on that one. Uh, and I think anyone does it because they feel like you know upsetting the apple cart. Yeah, and that does happen absolutely. But um, it, you know, it's it's always a worry that if if you're going to have the attitude that he had, um, yeah. and that's the norm, um, then it doesn't say a great deal about the the safety culture of the organisation. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, super, super important. This is all very, I think, all very serious. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, it's amazing. It's it's fantastic to hear you talk with such such passion and love and incredible knowledge. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it is, yeah. the, one thing which we have got is there is a little bit. It's quite crackly. Your end is it crackly for okay. you, James? When you hear Jeremy, I, I get crackly. I can, I can hear him most. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Again, a, a tiny little crackle, but not to, uh, uh, okay. nothing that detracts from it. Can I? Are you able? To, can I kick you out and you come back in? Yeah. Is that possible? I'll just do that now and see if that'll do any better. Uh, I'm going to leave. The atmospheric. I'm not really. Do you want to? Yeah. It's brilliant, isn't it? Mm. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Norfolk, we. Suffolk. <laughs> yeah. Is he crackly for you, Jim? I'm getting just very tiny little crackles. Okay. Not constant crackles, but every so often I hear a little, yeah. little sort of, But Hello. Hey, is that better? That is a little bit better, actually. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try and be as inanimate as I possibly can, which is difficult because I'm one of these people that flails a lot, you know, when, you, when they talk. <laughs> you it, away, we love Jeremy. the passion. Yeah. It really yeah, is. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, but it's an amazing industry. Yeah, it is. Um, so, Jeremy, do you think, I mean, when are we likely to come out of the current situation? And, and when eventually that does happen, do you think because of the kind of thing that you're talking about JetBlue doing, people will look at that and think, actually, yeah, let's make flying a good experience again? Oh, it has to be, Rob. You know, I think anyone that's been in the industry as long as I have, and it's been, what, 37 years, um, I I'm still in it because it needs to be a great experience. Um, you know, if you ask the average person that's running an airline or running an airport, um, they want happy customers because um, there's nothing more demoralizing for, for the staff 
um, when they're constantly having to deal with with the the, the sort of the, the aggravations and the frustrations that people have, um, you know, and that that goes for the staff working in the organisations. You know, we've we've all been there as as aviation professionals. You know, you, you sort of go in in the morning, and, oh here we go again. It's like Groundhog Day, and, um, <laughs> you know, and you get crew like if you're a crew and they're calling you up and they say, oh we might need you to think about a bit of discretion. Don't be talking to me about discretion. So there are lots of challenges in the industry, um, and I do I do believe as we spend the next sort of um three to four months getting through the summer the winter is going to be when airlines generally have less flying anyway because the, the the schedules change um primarily to enable aircraft to go into the hangars for for the the, the, the annual and routine inspections but while that's going on um it is definitely going to be a case of let's all get the airlines and the airport sat together talking about what is the long term solution and uh, how are we going to make aviation resilient if and when another pandemic were to hit i mean statistically the annoying thing with all of this is that actually during the pandemic um there were less people getting covid19 sitting inside airplanes yeah. than there were walking around the supermarket touching the trolleys um and uh, you know, lots of people were scaremongering, saying, oh, aviation is carrying the, the, the germs everywhere. It was hogwash, to be brutally honest. Um, so we are going to have yeah. to change, and we do have to get better at looking after our people. Um, we've just got this world where there aren't enough staff. So once we start paying a bit more, investing a little bit more in looking after our people, um, I get quite annoyed with senior senior business um, colleagues when you, you know they keep chasing after the bottom line all the time and we're in a world now where we've got to manage expectations be realistic with the customer I go back to talking to people about transatlantic flying when when Dicky first started you know way back in in the early 80s um, he was operating an old um, 747 um, uh, 100 um, and it was, it was, it was a 200, you're right, yeah. Dickie is Richard Branson, is it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so Richard, Richard was operating his, his thing, and then there was Highland Express were doing the same thing, People Express were doing it, and all of that lark. Um, and um, so in those days, when you sat down inside the aeroplane, you had this, like, rubber tube-type headset thing that just pushed you into it. <laughs> There was a screen at the head of the at the cabin that was grainy. You've got no hope of ever knowing what the damn film was. No. And, <laughs> and you were paying like um, you know three hundred and fifty, four hundred quid. Um, yeah. Now you're paying two hundred pounds. You're getting a hundred channels of in-flight entertainment, Wi-Fi, a choice of menu. They're even giving you ice cream mid-Atlantic. <laughs> so this is why we're now in the problem we're in. We've we've. Do you Think the age of the, the, the low cost is gone or is going or it, I, I is think that that sort of if I look at EasyJet, you know, I mean, bless them, they they're, they're hemorrhaging big time at the moment. They're really struggling to mm. to get the model to work. Um, and even Wizard and, and and Ryanair are because you know they're openly admitting now that these low cost fares are are going to be less and less available. Um, I think what we're probably going to see, and I might be wrong, um, I think we're going to see a little bit more consolidation. Mm. Um, I wouldn't be at all surprised. I mean, if you, if you see JetBlue in the States, they're the sixth biggest um, carrier in the States. They're now trying to buy Spirit, um, which is an ultra-low-cost carrier. Mm. Um, and that's a sign of, I think, where some of it's going to go. And I wouldn't be surprised if in Europe we end up with, um, you know, a, a marriage of, of low cost airlines coming together because it will sheer, it will be literally the sheer volumes if they can do it that will enable them to stay in a good space because okay. that's how they survive they survive by stacking them high and and just keeping them going um, and it's it's a model that has worked Same to cheap, this yeah. point. Yeah. Do you think the the age of the club eighteen thirty and and the sort of cheap package holiday for some people will become a thing of the past or? It, it will just be you will have to save your money for one holiday a year and not two. It's that kind of thing. I think, I, I think that's exactly where it's going. Um, and the reason I think it's going in that direction is people just don't have the disposable income. You know, going away and having six or 12 weekend breaks away for nine ninety nine are gone. 
Um, and even if you, when you get there, are you going to find a hotel that's going to let you stay cheaply? I mean, my nephew, he, he was moaning at me like hell yesterday. He, he rang me and he said, I'm trying to get to Nice. And I said, well, yeah, that's fair enough. What about it? And he said, have you seen how much the air fares are? And my response to him was, I don't care what they are, because if they're really high, it's probably realistic. Um, so he said, I've got to try and get there for less. I said, well, no, you need to pay what they're yeah. asking for. It is the nature of the beast now. So I think you're right. People are going to get back to the old days of saving. Um, and it could actually be the revival of the package holiday. Um, you know, we might suddenly find travel agents go back into business rather than out of business because, um, mm. it, you know, people will be um, more concerned about trying to arrange things for themselves. Because if you try and do that right now, um, it's a little bit of a lottery. Um, you know, people are finding it more and more difficult. But we've, we've got to get better as an industry uh, at letting people know as far in advance as we can that we've got issues. Um, you know, TUI have, have, have come a bit unstuck because they've, their crewing has just not worked the way they hoped it would. Um, and so but they've been fairly brutal in not cancelling, you know, somebody's flight and trying to arrange something else. They're cancelling entire holidays because it's easier. Mm. Um, you know, it's that whole, but it, it, it doesn't help the poor person who's booked the holiday and it's, at the airport with the kids and, 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 it's, and it's, that's, it's that's buying no loyalty from your customers is it? i mean I, I run a business you don't upset your customer you, you you have to sell them that the price may have gone up we've all been through that in every part of it it's not like we don't know the prices of things are going up but the one thing you do do is you look after the people who pay your wages and 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 who keep your shareholders happy is you've got to look after your customers so i don't understand you say it's easier but it's very short-sighted, isn't it? Jez has got no, a flight. Has... Jez has got a flight. His first flight for a long while coming up in a couple yeah. of days. Yeah. <laughs> he's very I'm, anxious I'm, about I'm, this. I'm, 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 I'm flying to Gothenburg <laughs> via Brussels on Friday. You're going, oh, you're going via Brussels. Oh, that's actually, you know, they were bigging themselves up today, Brussels, because they had a bumper <laughs> month last month. Perfect. Um, so, and, and it's okay. You should be fine. I mean, the, 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 the reality of it is that... Um, what, what's been happening, um, the, the staff who are going into work every day are working their socks off. They are absolutely running on empty in every facet of, of aviation. Um, and sometimes the people at the coalface, um, it doesn't matter whether they're flying the aeroplane, whether they're pushing the trolley or whether they're checking the customers in or handling the aircraft on the road, sometimes they're actually not aware of what's going on because the, the, the communications um, can be woeful on occasions. Um, and one of the worst things in the world is when you've got ground handling agents who um, are given half a set of information um, and they only give half a set of information to the customer, it makes it really, really difficult to manage. Um, you know, and if an airport is struggling or a ground handler is struggling or an airline is struggling, just be up front with the customer. Um, because being up front with the customer, whilst it is definitely going to annoy them, um, the honesty is the bit that will say to them, do you know something? We got it wrong today, and I'm really sorry about that, but we know why we got it wrong. It was because of X, Y, and Z, and we're now doing this to fix it. Whereas in the past, um, as an industry, it, it behaves a little bit like theatre land. Um, you are only as good as your last performance, um, and – so in the past, it's been quite blingy and they've, they've kind of tried to sort of cover up some of the failings and some of the, the, the challenges they have. It, on, on occasions, it can feel a bit like fur coat, no knickers. And, and you're kind of <laughs> thinking, you're, you're, you're thinking to yourself, go and tell them the truth. And I've always been somebody in 37 years that goes out and tells the brutal truth because I would much rather be honest yeah. with people and then do everything I could to fix the problem for them. Because that's what it's about. And, um, you know, the one thing I would say is when they're when aviation's having a bad day, boy, does everybody dig deep. And get on with it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when the when the BA 38 um, landed short um, at Heathrow, um, I was actually managing um, British Airways uh, ticketing and transfer teams. Um, and I was literally just about to walk out and go home. And somebody said, oh, I think one of ours hasn't quite made it. <laughs> Anyway, I looked out the window, and sure enough, there it was, slightly short. Um, no word of a lie. <laughs> As you can imagine, Heathrow came to a grinding halt. Um, and we had, um, within minutes, we had 
upwards of 10,000 people standing outside ticket counters wanting help. Um, nobody complained. The staff dug in. They got on with it and they rallied together. Um, you know, we were there for a week clearing that backlog. Um, and every airline was in the same boat. The airport was in the same boat. But we all got on with it. And we got on with it because we really believe that um, we need to look after people. So my appeal to anybody that's going through an airport at the moment They've got to remember that it isn't all about them, because the one thing that's happened with COVID, and it's sad to say it, because everybody's been doing what we're now doing, chatting via the Internet. And that's their, their rather strange interaction with humans. Um, when they get into a world where they've got to behave with a certain amount of reasonableness, um, they start to lose their marbles because they're not used to um, not doing things themselves the way they want to. And unfortunately, any time you want to travel anywhere, whether it's by train, plane or boat, you've kind of got to follow the rules at some point, because otherwise it's just going to go horribly wrong for you. I mean, if you think about going through security, I can't tell you how many airports I've been through in the last six months, watching people having to be re-educated about what a sealed plastic bag is. <laughs> no more than <laughs> and I, I walk around with one just as a demonstration model. I, I, I keep having Blue Peter moments where I get them out and say, here's one I prepared earlier, because people have completely forgotten. It's like they walk through the metal, you know, the, the walk through metal detector and they go off like a Christmas tree. And the first thing they always say, is that a random? No, it wasn't random. You've gone off because you've still got all the jewellery on you were asked to remove. You're still wearing the shoes you were asked to take off. So there is a little bit of the issue is being caused in some cases by the customers only being interested in themselves. And we can't be like that. We've got to be, we've got to be concerned yeah. about everybody. That's a very yeah. good point. That is a good point. It's amazing. But Jeremy, with so many of us going off, and Jez mm -hmm. here is going off uh, to to Brussels, I, I'm due to go to Milan, Easy Jet, Gatwick in, in a few weeks for, for a work <laughs> thing. But, I mean, what is the advice to people who just don't know whether or not their flight is going to go or not? How do you – when should you know whether or not you've got a flight – when should you be contacted? Should we be contacting anyone to find out if everything's going to be okay? Yeah, no, the it, industry is starting to find a way of, of, of regulating this now. So in, in, in every um, airline and, and certainly um, at CEO level, um, they're making a commitment to try and plan at least two weeks in advance. Um, the, the, the challenge is always around. Um, um, you, you know how many crew you've got. Um, you don't know how many of your crew are going to contact uh, or contract again COVID. So that's having an impact because I can sit and have the best plan in the world that says, do you know something? I'm going to operate my entire schedule tomorrow. And then I wake up the next day and a third of my staff have all contracted COVID and they're not allowed to turn up to work. And at that point, I'm having to do cancellations. Um, the situation is improving. And some of that is because the rules around slots in bigger airports um, were amended to enable airlines to relinquish them temporarily. Because one of the reasons that we've seen so many flights getting cancelled is because airlines that hold um, legacy slots, particularly at places like Heathrow and Gatwick, if they don't operate um, uh, 90, I think something like 98 percent of the schedule um, within the, the, the parameters of the slot regime, um, they stand the chance of losing them. So somebody like British Airways that has the biggest amount of slots at Heathrow and EasyJet at Gatwick would be really nervous about cancelling things if they thought they were going to lose their slots because those slots eventually will have aeroplanes in them with people sitting in them. So the rules have changed, which means that there's been an amnesty on that policy so now airlines can actually sit down and be more robust with their planning. So I know for a fact that British Airways has looked at routes like Nice, Geneva, Edinburgh. These are routes that have got high frequencies that um, it doesn't warrant. So they start to strip them out. So anybody that's booked on those flights are getting told well in advance. Um, on the day cancellations, they are going to continue to happen. Um, mm -hmm. And when they do, you, you know, you just need to be really clear with what your rights are. And that can all be found on the UK CAA's website. Um, airlines don't like cancelling things. No one likes doing that because it's bad for business. Uh, my advice is to, if you can, try and travel with hand luggage only, pack it and, and, and be sensible with it. Um, don't turn up too early. 
you know, people are turning up three, four, five hours before departure, and they're actually preventing the sensible people who are turning up two hours before departure from getting through security, <laughs> which is creating a backlog. <laughs> so it, it really is, um, you know, and if you're going to go to somewhere like Paris or Milan, if you can do it from another airport, a regional airport that isn't one of the big hubs, do it because um, they're less likely to get cancelled. Um, you know, you, you look at places. I mean, somebody said to me just the other day up at um, the BBC in Manchester, they were talking about going away and um, what should they do? They wanted to go from Manchester. And I said, well, go to Leeds. Get a Jet 2 flight from Leeds because they've got a flight to the same place. And I promise you, um, you know, Philip and his team at Jet 2 will run that flight. <laughs> and um, sure enough, so she's booked it. So now I'm praying and hoping I'm going to have to send Philip an email. <laughs> It doesn't matter what you cancel, fella. You just can't cancel that one. But um, <laughs> I end up looking like a fool. But the truth is, um, you know, for example, if you live in if you live in Edinburgh and you're looking for a long haul flight and you're going east, then actually coming down to London to connect to British Airways might not be a great idea unless you can come down on the train um, because that may well get cancelled. The long haul flight won't be. Um, the other option would be, of course, to look at what airlines operate out of those airports to the long haul destinations. I mean, if I was going east um, and I lived somewhere between Newcastle and, and Edinburgh, I'd probably go to Newcastle and get on an Emirates flight via Dubai. Um, so it's about do your research. Um, you know, if you can find a regional airport, I would recommend you use them. Um, if you're doing long haul flying, um, you should be fine um, because, you know, the long haul flying programs are the things that are being protected um, at the moment because um, that is genuinely um, where they're able to cover, um, you know, the operation more easily. Oh, that's brilliant advice, Jeremy. Thank you very much indeed. I'd just like to take you right back to the beginning when we're talking about your love of aviation as an 11 year old. You talked about Russian jets. Why Russian jets? Were you living in Russia at the time? Yes. Yeah. So um, my, my local airport would have been Pulkova, St. Petersburg. Oh, okay. And um, yeah, so um, and then when I arrived in the UK um, and I, I went to Terminal 2 to um, send my sister, she was going over to Germany to see her pen pal. And um, in those days, they actually had a decent place where you could go and stand and watch aeroplanes. Yeah. They got like a coffee shop and everything. I don't know why airports. <laughs> Don't build them back in because yeah, yeah, it's yeah. ridiculous because, you know, it's a great place to take the kids to sit and watch, you know, granny arriving or granny departing or whatever. Airports are really remiss with this because, you know, the threat to security for those things is minimal. And the people who go up to those places are people like us who love aeroplanes. But, um, you know, I remember standing up there and, and watching you know, the, the 747s, you know, the Pan Ams and the TWAs and some of the airline, the great airlines of the world that have vanished. Um, and I just stood in absolute awe of, of, of just how brilliant it is and how clever it is. And, and even now, you know, I was I, I get really excited talking to people about kind of the changing technologies and things. And the guys who have got a, a Dornier 228, which is a, a nice little twin <laughs> Um, engine turboprop great little sort of 12 seat thing um and um they're doing a, an, an electric version of it at the moment in the uk and it just excites me that we are despite the challenges that we've got we are constantly trying to find ways of being better i mean even on the flight deck you know in the years years ago you used to have to take the entire flight library every every map and every you know document associated with the aircraft and all the all the um you know the en route maps and everything it's all now in a beautiful ipad that you can just have sat next to you on the flight deck taking all of that weight off of the aircraft you know we're, we're working so hard to be sustainable um, when everybody else doesn't seem to really care. Um, so, um, you know, if you look at some of the stuff going on with, with fuels, biofuels and all the rest of it, eventually that's going to be superb. And the upper airspace redesign, I mean, I was down at Swanwick um, a few weeks ago and I was in a workshop around the redesigning of the upper airspace in the UK. And they've already done some work with that over Scotland. And that makes a massive difference to the amount of fuel that needs to be burnt because you're saving so much time by eliminating, um, you know, this historical sort of um, waypoints along set navigational things. It's just brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Jeremy, it's so much. I, I just want to, a couple more questions. And then we have our top landing gear quiz. Would you be prepared to be a contestant on the top landing gear quiz? 
Well, I mean, so long as all the answers are Marmite, I'd be delighted. (laughs) (laughs) I think you'll do rather well. But that's great news for us. But just before we go there, still stepping back in time a bit, when we first caught sight of you on the original airport in the 1990s, you were working for Aeroflot. I assume that's because of your your Russian links. I've I've no idea. But how did that come about? How did the BBC find you, and and you became this this great overnight star? Yeah, it was kind of. I mean, to be honest with you, I I, I really didn't want to do it. I I'd um I'd been in in Moscow. I'd, I'd been at a meeting, and I'd um been told that I was going to get promoted and sent to Siberia in a great pleasant way um <laughs> to run the freight training academy in Krasnaya, yeah. which is in central siberia so i was super excited because i really love seeing people develop yeah. and um you know see them flourish and, and blossom into great aviation people so i was super excited and i got out there um the winter had just started it was minus 45 outside um everything was freezing and um the phone rang and it was actually the director general of the airline who was actually Boris Yeltsin's son-in-law and he said to me they need, need you back in London for a few weeks that's all right fair enough so I got back to London and, and a, a producer from the BBC was sat in my office and I said what do you want and he said well I've just been in Moscow making a program about the T-34 tanks and um, yeah, I, while I was there I was working with a researcher and she said whatever you do you must go and meet old Jezza there um, at Heathrow working for Aeroflot because regardless of anything else, the bloke's clearly not right in the head. Um, <laughs> you're probably going to find good, good value for money with a telly. So he turned up, this guy, and I literally spent two days trying to fob him off onto some of the other staff and pretending I didn't really want anything to do with it. I then didn't think anything more of it. About three months later, um, they appeared, suddenly appeared in the office. Um, and I rang Moscow and said to them, have you agreed to this? And they said, yes, of course. Why would we not agree to it? And I said, well, I was kind of hoping you wouldn't. Um, and literally, I then spent the next however many years it was, four or five years, um, every year being filmed for week on end, um, showing the, the, the reality of, of what aviation is all about. Um, and, you know, that's what was really nice about being able to go back to Heathrow because I was able to take my, my wisdom the additional 25 years of wisdom with me um, and get reacquainted with old friends and, um, you know, parts of the airport infrastructure that despite all of those blingy, glossy buildings still exist. There's still bits of the airport that um, are like they were when I was there years ago. Um, And, you know, it's it's amazing because that first night when the the series went out, um, I got stuck on the M25 the following day because a, a truck driver... Um, had seen I was because I was in a, a car marked with Aeroflot and he actually stopped and, and wanted an autograph <laughs> and I caused the bail back on the M25 um, at sort of half past five in the morning and then the rest was history really <laughs> That's yeah. uh, who was the BBC <laughs> producer can you remember from all those years ago John Farron Buck Farrow no don't know yeah. <laughs> okay yeah, yeah really really lovely guy very passionate um you know, and, and I think that the thing that's been really good about this series is that the cameraman I had with me knew absolutely nothing about <laughs> Um he, he doesn't like going in the... <laughs> so I, I managed in the end, because I said to him, I can't have you around here not knowing anything. <laughs> so I bought, I bought him a few books, gave him some nighttime reading, and um, I said to him, uh, every every day is a school day with me, um, so we'll, we'll hopefully get away. And look, he came with me, obviously, to New York, and um, I said, oh, we should have an okay-ish flight. It doesn't look like it's going to be too choppy. It um, should be um, fairly smooth. And at the end of it, he said, actually, I've really enjoyed this. Um, and he's become a bit of a, an av geek himself now. I keep getting the, the occasional pictures of things that he sees passing his house in Brilliant. Chiswick, Brilliant. Um, which is great. Brilliant. Oh, superb. Fantastic. Oh, Jez, can we call you Jez? Would you know really Jeremy yes, of course or Jez? You can. Everyone calls me Jez that knows me, so that's absolutely – well, I say that, I get called an awful lot of yeah. other things. Possibly <laughs> wouldn't want to respond to Yeah, so does our Jez here as well. Yeah. Uh, but it's, a, it's an affliction we have, isn't it, Jez? <laughs> exactly that, exactly. Right. But listen, if you really think you've got time to hang on and do a quick – Top landing gear quiz that would just make our day. It's incredibly low quality. How, how long do you have? <laughs> have you got? We got well, five minutes. Is that? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the, the great thing is, if I don't think I know any of the answers, the connection may become very intimate. Well, <laughs> yeah, mine's a bit dodgy as well. Yeah, actually, yeah. those yeah. connections, <laughs> yeah, they're, yeah, they're not great. So, <laughs> Jez, I will just give you a few little pointers. Um, we all have different buzzers that the guys will have prepared before they come here, which are meant to be relevant to the uh, subject. But I wouldn't expect you oh. to do that because we've only just asked you to be on it. And there will almost inevitably be one question that relates to the country of Malaysia or Malaya, because it's where I was born. And there's a lot of aviation history in Malaya. So, and it trips the guys up every single time. So let's just, so just that, that just a little something for you to look out for. All right, let's go around the buzzers then as quickly as we can, gents. Um, Roy, that what have you got? Mine is, I can hear it. Is that the airport for you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 the original thing. <laughs> original, <laughs> yeah. Well Old school. done. Well done, the Muso. <laughs> Excellent. Jez, what okay, about Okay, we were talking about holidays and package holidays. I've got the holiday theme from 1978. Oh, brilliant. Oh, yeah. Oh, lovely. Yeah. It's good, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it yeah. sounds like... Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I can't remember who it's composed by, but it's somebody famous. Um, James... I, you look like you're frozen, James. Yeah. But come on. have you got a buzzer? In uh, well, I have got a buzzer. Buzzer is based on these guys that went to Gatwick Airport and Heathrow, I think, and um, got them to read out silly names um, that made oh, that it sound like. Um, um, so I've got this one. They, they asked to, um, if uh, Makalik had just vatted and left the room, the bastard uh, is available. And it just sounds like my colleague just farted and left the room, the bastard. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my uh, that's my buzz of this week. I like that. He, he always lowers the tone, old Jimbo. Always. <laughs> the, 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 the people working on the information desk hadn't even clocked it. That was what was so brilliant about that. <laughs> It, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And uh, so, Jess, um, have you got a little buzzer? We, I mean, you might just want to go. Bzz. I might just have to go. Err. Yeah, yeah, that would do. Perfect. And maybe wave as well, because <laughs> yeah, there's, but, a bit, I'll, I'll there's a bit. There's a little bit of waving. There's a little bit of. Be there's a little bit of breakup on the on the feed. So, to be honest oh, with wow. you, also, you'll probably be the only one answering any questions. <laughs> we are crap at these quizzes. <laughs> okay, here we go then. Yeah. And this is all to do with uh, airports, holiday flying, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The top landing gear quiz. Question one. Oh no, that didn't work. There we go. In the 1970s, Freddie Laker introduced his no reservation turn up and board service between London and New York. What was it called? Yes, Jeremy Spake. <laughs> Say that again, Jeff. Skytrain Sky is absolutely I knew that. right. Spake is off the mark. There's a <laughs> bonus question. Oh, what, no, that's cruel. Yeah, no, it's not cruel. You'll love this. What aircraft did he use on the Skytrain service? He used the McDonnell oh. Douglas DC 10. <laughs> Just hold that. I think, Jez, your namesake buzzed in first. I was going to say TriStar. Well, you were wrong, and it is the <laughs> oh, DC Sun. Well done. Dead. I didn't realise I didn't get the bonus question to myself. I mean, yeah. that's cheating. No, I should have, I should have, I should have explained. I but in fact, like, I thought this was University Challenge where I get the bonus question. <laughs> no, we're not quite that high, bro. This is this is universally uh, challenged. I think more like. <laughs> yeah, Good. So uh, after the first question, uh, Jez, our guest, leads with two, and no one else has yet scored. Um, question number Standard. two. Which notoriously tricky airport has a runway extension built on stilts? Uh, yes, Jeremy Speak. Madeira. Absolutely correct. The correct name for the airport itself? Oh, I can't remember that. Funchal. Funchal, that's the one. Well done. It is indeed Funchal, Funchal Airport in Madeira. I've been in there a few times. It's like, have you flown into there, Jeremy? Uh, yeah, it's a tricky little spot. Quite fun, isn't it? Get a bit of you get this. Uh, I've landed. Quite cheap. Yeah, the, the the sort of side. What do you call it when you get those? It's not a downdraft. Rotor winds. You get rotor winds. So cross, cross, um, yeah, cross winds. Yeah, wind shear. Cross winds. Wind shear. Wind shear. That's the one. Thank oh, you very much. Shear. Well done. Question number three: In which country are these airports? Fuck, fuck. Muko, muko, and am I high? Yes, Roy has uh, uh, Malaya, Malaysia. Ma Ma Roy says Malaysia, <laughs> and you are 
incorrect. Uh, oh. <laughs> Cracking try. <laughs> it's not Malaysia. Anyone else that want to have a go at Fuck Fuck Muko and Am I High? Yes, Jess. Thailand. It's not Thailand, but you're not far off. Jeremy Speak. Vietnam. It's not Vietnam. You're all in the oh. same, the right kind of area. Uh, James Cartner, you're freezing, but have yes, a go. Yes, I, I, I was <laughs> I had the answer, and it's got. Um, it's it's Thailand, isn't it? <laughs> no, Thailand. You're, Jeremy Curling said Thailand. Do you want to have one more go? I don't know. No. no. Um, China. No, it's Indonesia. Oh. Oh, Indonesia, in Indonesia yeah, but yeah. you're sort of all in the right area. Let's let's try another. Uh, what about these ones? Uh, silly, silly, car, car, and linger, linger. <laughs> He's a genuine Have we said airport. Yet? Uh, Malaysia. <laughs> Malaysia says Roy, and he is incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to have a go on Silly Silly, Car Car and Linga Linga? Oh, uh, okay, Jess. Australia. It's not Australia. And I think we've run out of time on this yep. question. It's Papua New Guinea. Oh. Papua A little New obscure, Australia. maybe. Australasia. Yeah, Australasia, maybe. No, yeah. well, yeah, Pacific. Once you said Port Morsby, everybody gives up after that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do one more set of airports. Black Tickle, Pickle Lake and Flin Flon. You have These are all genuine. <laughs> oh, yes, Malaysia. Boy. Not Malaysia. Oh, Bad luck. These are great <laughs> efforts. Well done. Glad Malaysia's getting a good shout. Anyone want to go with this? You might. Is it America? It's not quite. A little bit north of America. Oh, Canada. Canada. Well, oh, Canada. Jeremy Canada. Spade, who scores a fourth <laughs> point. So our leader after all five questions, Jeremy Spake with four, four. James Cartner has none. Roy has none. Jez, none. Uh, well, this. Yeah, you're, doing, you're doing very well. Next question. London Heathrow's IR to code is LHR. Gatwick's is LGW. Which airport is LGK? The Gatwick is LGW. Heathrow. Yes. Jeremy. Is it Langkawi in Malaysia? <laughs> it is Langkawi in Malaysia. You're absolutely right. You didn't oh, get thrown by the LG. Shocking. Fantastic. This is shocking. That's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> well done. You're, that's, that's you're just not brilliant. coming back on this, Jeremy. <laughs> no. Happy days. I don't mind. It's been a pleasure anyway. No, it's there are more. Have you got time? There are more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Carry on. Okay. The world's first jet airliner was the DH Comet. Which airline was the last to operate it, retiring it in November 1980? Yes, Jeremy Spake. Dan Air London. Dan Air London is the correct answer. Well done. Um, I definitely need to get out more. No, you're, you're, you're doing, doing very, very well. Um, now, between 1956 and 1958, when the Comet was grounded due to structural failures... Which airline became the only airline in the world to run a jet passenger service? <laughs> yes, Jeremy Speak. Aeroflot. Aeroflot is the right <laughs> answer. Oh, geez. Your old airline. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. Well done. It was Aeroflot. And because uh, a lot of people would, gone, would have gone for these Pan are very Am or GWA. He's I'm very good, isn't he? He's very good. Um, it's that, 104, it was. Well, that was my next question. What aircraft uh, <laughs> did they use? It was indeed the TU 104. <laughs> well, well now I'm running out of paper to write your scores on, Jess. Uh, a, a second bonus then. What was the NATO code name? for the TU-104 in its bomber, original bomber configuration. It was a converted bomber, wasn't it, that Aeroflot used? Was, what yeah, was the NATO oh, code? You know, really this is open to everybody. Like, it was something like Kook or something like that. Not quite. Blinder. Blinder. Blinder is incorrect, Roy? Yeah. Yes, uh, Jez. Bear. Oh, no, it wasn't the bear. You're closer. It was the badger. Oh, it was the, the badger. badger. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... Right, OK. We'll have two more questions if you've got time, Jez, to stay on yeah. with us. OK, here we go. What is the world's shortest scheduled passenger flight? <laughs> yes, Jeremy Speak. It's the Logan Air Service that goes from Westray to Papa Westray. In the Orkney Islands? In the Orkney Islands, and it lasts something like... 63 seconds or something. I'll ridiculous. give you a bonus point for that. It actually lasts... Well, the scheduled time is... Uh, 
is one and a half minutes. It's closer to a minute, and the record yeah. was 53. 93 minutes, seconds. It was 53 seconds. Point That's away. unreal, isn't it? Point Imagine away it. for James for getting it wrong. <laughs> yeah, well done. And and finally, last question. I mean, it's very close, this contest. <laughs> which, which former fleet air arm base, now a commercial airport, was known as HMS Early, spelled U-R-L-E-Y? They flew fairy barracudas torpedo bombers in the Second World War. Oh. Again, uh, which former fleet air arm base, now a commercial airport in the UK... Hello, yeah. Presswick. Not Presswick. Jez. Coldrose. I don't mean oh, Coldrose. Nice. The one next to it. The Cornish one. Coldrose. Yeah. That's St. what they Or St. Morgan. You mean. That one. Neither. Okay. <laughs> uh, Roy. I have no idea. No? No ideas? Uh, <laughs> Jez, no ideas? I'm just going to say Ronald's way because... That's where you used to work as airport manager. <laughs> you are correct. <laughs> and a bit, bit embarrassing if you, if you hadn't got that one. That would have been a little turn up for the boys. Yeah. Eh? yeah, it is Ronald's way on the Isle of Man. You're absolutely right. It's right. Manx for Eagle early. Did you know? It that? is. Yeah, we get bonus point for that then. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, we need to read the scores. Now. Okay, let's go through the scores. In last place with minus one. Uh, it's James Cartner. Our aviation expert. Our, our aviation expert. How did I get minus one? How did I get minus one? How did I get minus one? You, you said something That's that irritated just... me. Um, <laughs> joint... I think it might be your Thailand answer, James. <laughs> I think you'd already heard it from Jed. <laughs> <laughs> joint, he just copies me. Joint second with North. Well done, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank Roy you and Jez Curling. <laughs> but our winner... With 12, <laughs> which is the record highest score. In fact, if we turned up everyone's scores over the two years this podcast has been Ever. running, we wouldn't have got to 12. <laughs> so it's Jeremy Spake. You are our first guest uh, to be on the Top Landing Rio quiz, and you are our winner. Uh, what what a performance, so Jez. Uh, what would you like Brilliant. as your prize? We always give away a prize. Actually, um, just being here has been... Surprising enough, to be uh, honest. I've had a lovely evening. We know we're not going to top fashion. Fashion. Get the Scan of the Girls concert. Scan of the Girls tickets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> would, you, would you accept a couple of Scan of the Girls tickets? Yeah, absolutely. Why not? That'd be fantastic. Yeah, you, 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 can you can't even give them away. Yeah, you can't even give them away. You can go look them up now and find out who they are. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Jeremy, we are so grateful to you. You're a, Thank you. Just You're very welcome. Yeah. It's just great. Thanks for all your time. Well done. You're very welcome, gents. It's been a real pleasure. Take care and have <laughs> a great evening. So Cheers, Jeremy. Cheers, Jeremy. Thanks Cheers. ever so much. Thanks, Jeremy. Bye now. Thank, Thank you, Jeremy. Cheers. Thank you. What a legend. Lovely. <laughs> lovely, lovely, lovely. That was brilliant. That was, brilliant. Brilliant. That was amazing. Well, 12. Well done. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> A huge thanks to Jeremy Spake. What a star. Brilliant. You know, I yeah. mean, celeb aviation expert. Quizzer. I'd have Quizzer. him for Prime Minister. I would. You yeah. should have asked. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I should have. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, he can lead the country to recovery. Wouldn't it be wonderful? And you can, of course, hear our full interview with Jeremy in our full Flaps edition, which will be available a week after this episode drops. So depending on when you're listening to this, it may well be there right now. And if you'd like to listen to any or all of our podcasts from our four series so far, you'll find them on our website, toplandinggear.com, or wherever you normally get your podcasts. And please do subscribe. It is completely free. And let us know anything or anyone you'd like us to feature in our next series, and we'll try and make it happen. You can get in touch with us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, at Top Landing Gear. And do email us your questions for our resident aviation expert, James Cartner at info at toplandinggear.com. That's info at toplandinggear.com. Two G's. Two G's. And as ever, please do recommend us to your friends. <laughs> We've got a bit of delay from, from James. Who's <laughs> <laughs> well done, Jimbo. Uh, yeah. He's still answering yeah. the third question of the quiz. <laughs> oh, always, good to hear <laughs> always good to hear from you, Jim. And... Uh, do you recommend us to your friends <laughs> and leave a review, especially if you've enjoyed it. We'll be back again with a new series once Roy has had a rest following Scouting for Girls' latest sellout tour. In the meantime, best of luck with your summer plans. I hope they go smoothly. Thanks so much for listening. And from all of us, bye for now. Goodbye. Two G's. <laughs> oh, that was amazing. This is Top Landing Gear.